नमस्ते नयन जोत वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बींग हियर एंड फॉर बींग पार्ट ऑफ द सीरीज इट्स एंटायरली माई प्लेजर रजनी I've heard a lot about the Ahimsa conversation. I feel delighted that you decided to go. Uh, That's probably you know, because I keep be flooding you with emails. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but That's really, not true. yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for being here. So, um, before we go into your uh, work as a scholar and a historian, I thought maybe on a personal note, what what would be the earliest in your own life as a child maybe that you uh, were introduced to the concept of ahimsa uh rajni as far as i remember ahimsa uh, is something that you know the concept of non violence is something that one encountered constantly in one's moral science books uh, in school this should be an integral part of the curriculum and i don't think moral science was my favorite subject and i certainly don't think it was uh, the favorite subject of my friends but looking back what i do uh, recall uh, is uh, you know a particular uh, image that uh, used to be you know that used to occur in those uh, books it's a famous a story of the three monkeys so you know the epitome of uh, see no evil hear no evil and speak no evil now at that point in time i had no clue at all that this is a story which is actually shared across cultures that it's a story which uh, you know you can encounter in uh, medieval japan and so on and so forth but as far as i remember i Uh, i think i had a sense that this was incorporated by gandhi ji in his teachings mm-hmm. and uh, you know uh, for me the whole idea of the story was that and gandhi ji incorporating it was that you know uh, ahimsa is not just about uh, you know your actions mm-hmm. it's also about your thoughts it is also uh, about your uh, articulation yeah your words and, uh, yeah so you know that was very important and here was uh, you know gandhi ji this figure who was steeped in uh, non violence who you know didn't uh, pick up a stick or a gun to combat the violence that was uh, you know being inflicted on his countrymen uh, on his uh, you know own people and so on and so forth so uh, this is something which uh, really uh, impressed me the most that there was this wonderful tale and that this tale was a part of this icon of uh, ahimsa in uh, you know contemporary india mm. but having said that i think in my mind and i remember that you know and that's something you encounter in history also when you think of ahimsa you also think of himsa of course uh, so you know when i used to think about uh, gandhi ji one thing when i was a kid which i just uh, you know couldn't uh, process was the fact that while he symbolized ahimsa he himself uh, you know had such a violent uh, death uh, so that really confused me as a child because uh, my father was in the army and i grew up in cantonments and things like uh, you know the tensions among uh, communities communalism hindu muslim problems i, I was entirely uh, innocent uh, of those in the context in which i lived but also in terms of the institutionalized learning uh, you know that was a part of my life these were not uh, things that were taught to you so uh, you couldn't at least for me i couldn't explain why uh, you know uh, the icon of ahimsa actually uh, you know was killed by uh, a gun wielding uh, man and yeah. even the way his death was imaged was you know you th- you had gandhi ji coming for a prayer meeting uh, you know and then being shot and falling and so on and nathuram godse was a kind of much more invisible figure 
Mm. And, you know, later, uh, I now teach a course on history and memory in uh, Ashoka. Mm. And, uh, you know, as you read along, you realize that when uh, Nehru uh, made his famous address uh, the night of Gandhiji's assassination, he too couldn't bring himself to actually, so, you know, this whole invisibilization was not just a part of my world, but mm. Uh, of the political world, he couldn't bring himself to take the name of Nathuram Godse. He just described him as a madman. So mm. for me, uh, there was just nothing in my mm. own context mm. which allowed me to understand why a figure of uh, non-violence had mm. to meet such a violent death. And the only thing which really helped, and that may have something to do with the fact that the, a lot of the schools, especially in my early years I went, that I went to work, you know, Catholic uh, convents mm. was the figure of Christ mm. that here too was another death of uh, another great man. And he too suffered a similar fate that, mm. you know, this is an icon of peace and this is how, uh, you know, he too uh, died. So, mm. uh, you know, that is the way I remember my encounters with uh, nonviolence. Yeah. And uh, and also that uh, nonviolence and violence actually worked cheek by jowl there because always, yeah. That in fact that is the purpose of this series. That that uh, that many speakers actually have looked uh, at the nature of violence and what drives it uh, as much as the striving for nonviolence, which is what we will also explore here today. So, you know, this, this uh, dilemma that you faced as a child about Gandhiji's assassination, maybe is a perfect entry point into the uh, issue of how and why it is claimed by some scholars and even pundits that the idea of ahimsa emerges in ancient India as a response to the Mahabharata or is, is first seen in the Mahabharat, because if I'm right, the uh, it may not have been written down, but the oral Mahabharat precedes the Buddha. Am I right? Uh, now, this is, you know, it's, it's a really good question, uh, Rajni, and it really depends. So, you know, you've come to the crux of the issue, which is that, you know, that so there are two questions here. One is that, well, the Mahabharat preceding, uh, you know, uh, the Buddha. There are those, and I certainly uh, believe that the Mahabharat does, uh, you know, precede, uh, you know, the renunciant tradition, whether it is uh, Buddhism, uh, you know, or uh, Jainism. But there are others who actually uh, see it as developing first in the renunciatory tradition. And there's a third group of scholars uh, who believe that actually the idea of Ahimsa develops uh, more or less simultaneously uh, across traditions. So, you know, this whole thing of a dialogue and a response uh, to, uh, you know, uh, violence and so on, uh, and that they're all, uh, you know, talking to each other and responding to each other through uh, this, uh, you know, in which case uh, you would put them all broadly, uh, you know, in the same uh, time period. But I think one thing is very clear that whether we are talking about uh, the Mahabharat or whether you're talking about the Buddha and Mahavir, uh, you know, the text of the Mahabharata, that's of course, uh, you know, it's, it's a great epic, but it's, it's a story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many stories are put together in the most wonderful way. But uh, it, it is uh, capturing, I mean, there is non-violence there. There's absolutely no doubt uh, about that. So to that extent, it's true. And uh, in the Mahabharat, the Param Dharma, one of the Param Dharmas is uh, Ahinsa. But I think one also has to keep in mind that there is no central message in the Mahabharat. Right. There are many messages. And there are many other Param Dharmas, so, you know, honoring guests, uh, following one spiritual uh, teacher, the Ved, you know, all of this is part of uh, Param uh, Dharma. And the text itself is steeped in violence. And that must have to do with the warfare of that time period. The same is true when you think about the Buddha. The Buddha lived in very violent times. And uh, 
You see, ironically enough, uh, all the renunciatory sects also got great patronage from all these, uh, you know, rulers and polities that were fighting each other or within their own state, X was killing off his, uh, you know, father or his brother or a series of brothers and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, we have to uh, keep that in mind and whether the Mahabharat was earlier than the renunciatory tradition, I don't know, but certainly my sense is that it is uh, earlier and there is the idea of uh, nonviolence that is there, but it is just one idea. It's not, uh, it's not a central idea. In fact, the text is steeped in violence. So, uh, and if you think about the Shanti Parva and you think about what, uh, you know, the dying Bhishma, the message he's giving to the vacillating uh, Yudhishthir, he tells him that, look, you be the king, you win heaven, you protect the virtuous and kill, kill the wicked because you cannot actually be a king without a violence. And you have Bhishma also saying that nobody can actually practice a livelihood that does not involve some amount of, uh, you know, hinsa. So, uh, you know, the bottom line uh, for that element in the Mahabharata is that you don't incur sin. If there is hinsa uh, committed by you as a part of your hereditary calling, so, you know, if you're a hunter, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Or if you're a king, uh, you know, coercive uh, force is a part of rulership. But so if you're following that, that's a part of your hereditary calling. And therefore, uh, you know, you don't incur sin by that, uh, you know, right. violence. By the same logic, uh, and I think this may have been across our multiple traditions on this subcontinent, Killing animals for food that is actually needed for your survival was not deemed to be hinsa. Because all life subsists on some form of life. Right? Am I right? So I think the maybe the most uh, the running thread through all this is the awareness that you cannot have an absolutist definition of ahimsa or of violence. Would that be fair? Uh, yes, but you have to then, I mean, try to, so beyond, uh, you know, the professional issue, you have to then ask yourselves that uh, why is, uh, you know, this so? So one way of looking at it is that, yes, this is, uh, you know, this is reasonable. This is practical. This is a pragmatic approach. Right. But then if you think about it, the first precept, for example, of Buddhism is ahimsa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th that is uh, very, very uh, central uh, to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And within Buddhism, there is this idea of not harming, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, just harming living beings as we understand them, whether it's humans and animals and other creatures, but also plants. Mm -hmm. So even something like farming causes uh, hinsa and so on and so forth. So there is uh, all that. But uh, at the same time, uh, there is a recognition that, well, uh, you know, there is this larger world where you are getting, uh, you know, you, are ha you have people who uh, will continue to do what they are doing because uh, a religious person does not have the power to actually change uh, the livelihoods or uh, you know the ways of thinking of entire population. In the case of a king, and even in the case of a king, as is evident from the case of Ashok, you know, and maybe we'll talk about that later. This doesn't uh, happen. People pretty much do what they want to do. So yeah. uh, maybe yeah. there was a recognition that well, you know, this couldn't be done. But if you think about the Jains, they took it to another level. Level. So you know, if you think about Ahimsa and the Jains, uh, there, uh, you know, the idea of sentient beings, even uh, beings which have just one sense, uh, and you know, those should not be harmed, and the whole idea of a mukhapatti and yeah. so on and so forth. That's taking it, uh, you know, to another level of uh, non-violence. Yes. So, uh, yes. and that's what makes ancient India, I think, so interesting. 
Yeah. That even within all the hinsa, there yeah. are, uh, you know, and even in texts like the Mahabharata, which yeah. you see as full of killing and war and, I mean, all sorts of, uh, you know, bhashans on the importance of uh, the battle and so on and so forth. You have this deep thinking that is happening yeah. on, uh, you know, ahimsa, and this deep thinking is taken to another level. But my sense is the pragmatism really comes from a recognition that religious teachers cannot do, uh, you know, cannot go beyond the point. They simply yeah. don't uh, have, uh, you know, that kind of power. Yeah. Yeah, true. At the same time, perhaps the epic texts also are a record of uh, the struggles of the Samaj to process these ongoing and in a sense, maybe they are eternal dilemmas. Of course, how far they go, how far back they go into our prehistoric past may be impossible to say. Uh, because that is actually what has emerged even from these uh, 100 plus conversations in this series, that it the whole striving for nonviolence, even just to understand it and to understand violence, is a is an ongoing process. It's there. there it's not something in which we are looking for a point of arrival. And, um, and yet there are periods in history where some dramatic moves have happened, you know, some uh, really kind of rare shifts have happened. So maybe this is where we move to Ashoka. And I first wanted to know what drew you to him or is it that if you're a scholar of ancient India, you can't avoid him at all. Uh, so I, I think, you know, there are two things here. Uh, I began doing serious research on Ashoka, uh, not because I have a deep interest in him, which I will, which I did, and I talk about that at greater length. And that's, uh, you know, why I accepted to uh, actually uh, do a book on uh, Emperor Ashoka. But I was, uh, I was in the middle of administrative work in the University of Delhi and I got this email from somebody who I didn't know. This was Sharmila Sen from the Harvard University Press saying that whether, uh, you know, I would consider, and even though she didn't know me, whether I'd consider doing a book on Emperor Ashok and they're very interested and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an administrator who enjoyed administration. So it was like a lifeline. And I said, yes, I will do it. And so in all my free time, I used to keep thinking about how this book will uh, evolve and how I will write it. So the actual research was spurred by a totally, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, fortuitous, uh, you know, uh, encounter between uh, a press and the, you know, potential author. But I think uh, I've been fascinated with uh, Emperor Ashok for a very uh, long time. And I have to say this, that actually he's fascinated generations of writers and scholars. There must be nearly 2000 publications on him. Uh, if you look at all the, you know, research, uh, papers and books and so on and so forth. And I think part of the reason that drew me to uh, him was uh, his manifest presence. So, uh, you know, he makes himself present uh, in India and uh, I mean India as in terms of, you know, India before partition and beyond India too in Afghanistan and uh, Nepal through a profusion of words and uh, so, you know, there are all his words that are, there's no image of him. We don't know what Emperor Ashok looked like, right? Really? So, you mean there uh, are no statues? There are no statues. So there are statues, rather there are relief sculptures which depict Ashok uh, a few hundred years after uh, the end of the Maurya dynasty. So, you know, there are some kings who make themselves evident through sculpture. So you think of the Kushan kings and you think of that famous headless uh, statue of Kanishk, right? There are other kings who make themselves evident through coins. 
So, you know, when you think about uh, the Greco-Bactrian rulers, a whole lot of others, you know, you think of that. But as far as Emperor Ashok goes, if you're asking yourselves a question that, you know, how do we know about him? What is it that we know about him, which is so different from uh, any other uh, ancient uh, Indian ruler? I think what makes him so different is that he was a constant communicator for nearly 20 years of his life. Mm. So, you know, he's constantly uh, putting down his thoughts uh, in uh, rock. Mm. So he's very ambitious. He wants those words and his thoughts to survive. Mm. And he's putting these up. So it's not like it's not being done in the context of his palace or court. He's putting mm. them up in public arenas. Yeah. Uh, you know, these words are inscribed uh, near places where people lived, along routes that people traveled, uh, in religious, uh, you know, places where people may have well gone, you know, they would have gone to worship and so on. Now, we know of about 50 odd places, five zero, where you can find his words uh, in India, in Pakistan, in Nepal, in Afghanistan. And originally, there must have been many more messages, but these are the ones, uh, you know, that have survived. So I think for me, the idea of an emperor making himself visible through his words was something that was, uh, you know, entirely novel. That was one thing. The second was that even as he's a great communicator, uh, look at the things he communicated about. He's not talking about taxing his people. He's not talking about uh, the army. He's not talking about the sorts of things you associate with statecraft. Mm. Uh, his public uh, communication is really about uh, his own metamorphosis. It's about, I would say in one line, if one has to put it, is to make his people feel that he is a flesh and blood uh, figure as all of them are. So he's not an, he wants them to think that he is not an imperious emperor. He may still sound like that, you know, but the fact of the matter is that's what uh, he wanted to uh, communicate. So what is it that he talks about? He talks about the fact that he's become a Buddhist. Huh? So his first message is about that, that he has made a move towards Buddhism and that it's a, it was a work in progress. Mm. So for example, to begin with, uh, he, was not, uh, he was not a zealous uh, uh, Buddhist, but a year and a half had passed and he became a zealous Buddhist after his association with the Sangha. So, uh, you know, he says that, look, and since then, I have actually uh, become a better ruler. I have made uh, gods and people mingle. So it's, it's, way, it's his way of saying that, look, I've made my empire a more moral place. And then he says that, look, you can follow my example. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you are a high person or a lowly person. This, this path is open to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, you think about what he says about Kalinga, that is something that, uh, you know, I used to feel constantly uh, moved about, that here is a ruler who has won a big war, but mm. he sees himself as actually having lost, uh, you know, he is from the jaws of victory, snatching defeat. Uh, he sees himself as uh, a defeated king because he takes responsibility for all the violence that he has mm. perpetrated, mm. right? So uh, when you think about somebody talking of his greatest uh, military success as yeah. a defeat yeah. because of the violence mm. and that he is now turning towards, away from that towards a new path, this really contrasts with the archetype of, uh, you know, a self-serving king or politician. Yeah. And you think of a person like Gandhiji and you think, well, you know, these are the universal Indians that we have. Uh, yeah. People who actually, uh, you know, uh, worked out a path for themselves, mm. which was completely different from anything, uh, you know, that was encountered uh, yeah. before. So these are some of the things. 
and of course i mean while i did this book where i i think i did uh, give a sense that i considered him for very good academic reasons based in his writings as a deeply compassionate and very impressive uh, ruler mm. uh, i was not the first to do it yeah, uh, yeah. you think of uh, his discovery through his words in the 19th century you think of h g wells you think of a nehru uh, you know so i think part of the fascination that uh, many people have for ashok also comes from this that um, you know we are drawn to leaders and to public mm. figures whose ideas and actions influence the lives of large numbers of people yeah so that even the first prime minister you know actually thought of Uh, Ashok, as somebody who was worthy of being memorialized, was again very, very impressive. So these are some yeah. of the things which drew me to Ashok. Uh, Nenjod, what is it about Kalinga that produces this effect in Ashok? See, I, as far as I know, he was uh, uh, a Buddhist before Kalinga, or he had been drawn, he had been introduced to, and he had been drawn to that uh, tradition, and he has been a victorious. military campaigner who has uh, you know seen many uh, scenes of uh, mass death now granted that records seem to indicate that kalinga is a kind of over the top situation i mean it's a kind of unprecedented carnage is it really just the scale of the carnage or is there something else in this in a sense the back story that might tell us more about this transition so one thing that you have to keep in mind is that the major uh, big war that ashok fought was the kalinga battle the empire was not created by him it was created by his grandfather chandragupta he just added kalinga to the empire of his father and his grandfather now my sense therefore is that he did not encounter violence if he had been a chandragupta and remember chandragupta also according to legends moved to jainism and died as a jain mm. you know that is uh, the story so my sense is he had not encountered violence on any scale even when he got his brothers killed off and i'm sure he did get many brothers killed off he would have got others to do it yeah because he was not meant to rule he was not the eldest son of his father so he kills off uh, members of his family and captures the throne of magadh and then is a very normal king to begin with the battle of kalinga shows that i don't think he is a practicing buddhist before this i think his encounter with buddhism is close because i mean if you think about the magadh court and if you think about uh, north india i mean this is very much a part of what north india was about but more importantly remember the woman in his life who's not there in his edicts but she's there in the pali uh, chronicles of sri lanka devi mm-hmm. you know who he who he had two children from uh and she whether he married her or didn't marry her she was his most important uh you know partner uh so she was a buddhist and she never converted to buddhism she was obviously a buddhist to begin with she was from vidisha and she had uh devanam uh, piyatissa the king of sri lanka she had uh, her son go there on the of course instructions of ashok so uh, mahinda her son is the one who converted uh, and converted not just devanam piyatissa but lots and lots i mean his entire court probably in sri lanka to buddhism her daughter from ashok who is uh, sangamitta she is the one who takes the bodhi tree That's again right. uh, on the instructions of ashok to sri lanka so there is all this uh, you know within his family and this is of course at a much later stage he is completely uh, is a different kind of ruler much before that so he you know buddhism is a part of his personal life and the larger uh, you know world of magadh but what is it that triggers uh, the shift i do think that kalinga uh, tried very hard to resist him 
So, you know, there was very strong resistance as, in, as he himself says, maybe with, uh, you know, uh, some amount of hyperbole, but he talks about the large number of people who perished. Uh, he talks about uh, the hundreds and thousands really of people in that category, people who were enslaved, uh, not just people who were part of uh, the army, but he talks about rather more ordinary people, innocent uh, civilians, if you would like, whose lives he actually describes as being very principled and virtuous. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says that, well, these were just violently interrupted. And he says, this is deplorable, you know, what mm -hmm. has happened uh, mm -hmm. as a consequence of this. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. talks about Brahmins and Shramans and other sects and householders who had lived there, lived very mod uh, morally and so on and so forth. So he himself is sketching out all these gory details for yes. us. We only know about the Battle of Kaling from his own 13th Rocky date, it's nowhere else. And you know, it's from that my senses, he doesn't say so, but I think it's that which triggers uh, a lot of uh, angst and a lot of trauma. Mm. And then he decides uh, to become, uh, you know, more openly in a sense a Buddhist. And then he himself says that it is his encounter and engagement with the Sangha, mm. which leads to him becoming a more zealous Buddhist, which then leads to him, uh, you know, uh, thinking through a different vision of rulership and governance. Wonderful. So that actually is where I was headed next. You know, you've said very beautifully that he represents a strag staggering reversal of the very conception of kingship, and you've described that just now. So what then were the complications of governance in this kind of frame? Uh, because uh, he wanted clearly to encourage nonviolence among his people. Uh, but if you if you push it down their throat, that itself would be a kind of violence. That, that is one. And there was still the, in a sense, won't go away dilemma that if you are also, as a king, you are responsible for keeping the law in order and for dealing with the, the rogue elements, the deviant elements, that are injuring innocent people, how did he resolve that? Then how do you deal with the, the criminal in a, in a system where you're striving for nonviolence? I think you, you know, uh, sort of put this very well because it is a big dilemma. So on the one hand, if there is the dilemma about uh, ahimsa, uh, that was put forward by uh, whether the Mahabharat or by uh, the renunciant traditions here too. I think if you read his edicts carefully, uh, there's a sense that it's not non-violence in all situations, no? So it really depended on how you stood in relation to the state. So in the 13th Rocky Dict, in the same breath when he speaks of Kalinga, he appeals immediately afterwards, and it's a continuous thing, to a group of his adversaries to follow his examples. And who are the adversaries? These are forest dwellers, the Atavikas. And he says, I hope you will repent as I had uh, so that you will not be killed. And he tells them that he possesses the power to punish them. So he's telling them that please turn away from your evil ways. I mean, obviously these are uh, people who he hasn't managed to pacify. So he's telling them that, look, take the uh, way, you know, that I followed and, you know, don't, uh, don't push me to a situation where, uh, you know, I have to use uh, my army against you. So I think he did recognize the realities of ruling a large empire where there were powerful groups who uh, had the capacity to undermine his uh, power. Mm. And, uh, you know, for all his turn towards uh, Dhamma and Buddhism, I don't think he ever ruled out uh, that, well, you had to resort to war when it was necessary. And even vis-a-vis -vis his own subjects, uh, Rajni, so if you think about it, 
he did not uh, you know seize the practice of punishments so mm. you know if you think of hinsa mm. but he grappled with the question of how harsh pun and punishments can be mitigated mm. so on 25 occasions he says in his edicts that uh, you know from the time of his anointment from the time of his abhishek he released prisoners on 25 occasions Uh, he also ordered an interlude of three days uh, from the time punishments were pronounced against those uh, prisoners who were going to the gallows. Mm. So you know the respite was to allow relatives of the prisoners to meet them, to ensure they had a more dignified uh, kind of death. they you know fasting or bestowing gifts all this is mentioned when he talks about mm. giving this interlude of 3 days uh, from mm. the time of punishment so i i do uh, think that you know he did uh, he did uh, recognize that mm. there is a limit mm. to uh, making non violence the centerpiece of everything yeah. that was simply uh, you know not yeah. uh, possible yeah at but the same having, sorry go ahead no 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 go ahead but having said that of course i think there is a sense that uh, you know if you think about uh, ahimsa as not just about raw power but mm. also about uh, you know and and curbing that raw power mm. uh, you know of uh, you know of uh, killing of hurting and so on if you think about in in terms of behavioral patterns i think he stressed a great deal on that so you know the fact that he uh, thinks it's very important that dhamma is uh, you know uh, is something where every sect honors every other uh, you know it's a kind of uh, proto secularism that he's talking about and he talks about gifting to all religious communities he talks about others having to follow his example because this is the way and you should never praise your religion above uh, you know uh, other religions you think about soft diplomacy so you know uh, if you think about the arthashastra and its idea about uh, you know impacting other kings it's through conquest Mm. uh you know mm. you're expanding your empire through conquest and here is a king who's saying that well uh, i'm sending missions to improve uh, facilities for people and for uh, animals yeah. along the uh, road so creating hospices not just within his empire but beyond in states that were uh, you know uh, on beyond his uh, western borders and so on and so forth so you know this compassionate and moral life in a sense which is so much a part of ahimsa is yeah. actually a part of it, this is very central to his idea of governance and also to his idea of foreign uh, you know policy yeah yeah no i was just going to mention that it is uh, fascinating that today you see uh, this uh, a, a somewhat similar uh, in latin america particularly uh striving for non violence that is driven by violence fatigue in countries where they have grappled with the civil wars and many other kinds of very violent conflicts and there one of the most powerful ideas that has arisen is the notion of restorative justice that so a wrong doing is recognized as wrong doing because somebody or something has been harmed and it must be rectified but in ways that enables and encourages the wrong doer to be restored to the good uh so i i can see that the, maybe the ancient roots of that not directly but at least in terms of human striving are in what you've just described so that's really fascinating um you kind of alluded to this a bit earlier uh, nanjo but i thought we could maybe do a little more detailed exploration of how and why the ashokan symbols are so powerful to our post independence life 
uh, actually, I think our generation, for I mean, those of us who are not historians, we first hear about Ashoka in childhood because his symbols are everywhere. The Ashoka Chakra, the Ashoka Stamb. So can you, would you feel comfortable saying a bit more about what was the significance of uh, our freedom uh, fighters and I mean, the post-independence leaders. And I don't think it's only Nehru. I, I have a feeling it's a, it's a, it's a more broad-based uh, kind of a, uh, inspiration. Uh, what were we harking back to according uh, that, you know, that you can share here? So I do think, uh, you know, that actually it is Nehru who is uh, very important in, uh, you know, in the whole uh, sort of debate about, uh, you know, the symbols. And uh, when he moved the resolution in the Constituent uh, Assembly, he talked about how the Dharma Chakra is actually a symbol of India's ancient culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a symbol for many things that India stood for uh, in the ages. And uh, he also, along with that said that it made him very happy because, um, you know, this was a symbol that was associated with Ashok. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is not just one of the most magnificent names in India's history, but in world history and so on and so forth. But uh, having said that, I think what happens post in, you know, I mean, at independence and just before that, that a symbol, remember the Dharma Chakra in the minds of most people and in the way it is in Emperor Ashok's, uh, you know, uh, pillars and so on, and in the uh, capitals that he put up, the Dharma Chakra is a symbol of Buddhism. Mm. Uh, if you think of the Sarnath uh, pillar capital, which had the Dharma Chakra on top, remember the Dharma Chakra nobody has seen in modern times. When it was excavated, uh, only a few fragments were found, not enough uh, to actually restore it. So if you go and see the Sarnath pillar capital, it doesn't have the Dharma Chakra. But, uh, you know, those four uh, lions in, uh, you know, as a part of the uh, design uh, of the uh, pillar capital and so on, that has been replicated in ancient times in many places. So you will find that in uh, the relief sculpture of the Sanchi Stoop of Kanganahalli across India, you will find, uh, you know, this occurring. Uh, Nagar, at Nagarjun Konda, Amaravati, and so on and so forth. And uh, then, of course, this is found, uh, you know, that this is the uh, pillar capital of Ashoka. But what Nehru does is to what is considered by Ashok to be entirely Buddhist, is transformed by him into a symbol for, uh, you know, all that India has stood for. And just a few years after that, a historian, uh, Vasudev Sharan Agrawal, actually provided a historical anchor to Nehru's idea. He has a small book on this, and he demonstrated that the Dharma Chakra on the top of the lion capital was not a sectarian concept, mm. but was the fruit of uh, a number of religious, philosophical, and cult motives, which had a universal appeal. Uh, you know, in the Indian tradition. That is, you will find it in Buddhism, but you'll find it in Jainism, in uh, Hinduism, and so on and so forth. So uh, here, this is what happens. You take something which is Buddhist, you make it something which stands for, uh, you know, the best principles that you associate with uh, ancient India. And then you have a historian stepping in who provides a kind of, uh, mm. you know, anchor for that. But it, uh, you know, that is really the Dharma Chakra is about teachings, the teachings of the Buddha and so on. It's associated mm. with uh, the turning of the wheel by the Buddha mm. when he gave his first sermon at Sarnath. Mm. But if you think about the remembrance of Ashok or, you know, not just in this way, Ashok is remembered as a Buddhist king, not because of his nonviolence, mm. but because 
uh, you know, he's the archetypal Buddhist king. He builds stupas. He gets uh, the earlier stupas where you have the relics of the Buddha opened, most of them with one exception, and he redistributes those relics. He gives Buddhism a kind of uh, visibility uh, across India and beyond, which it yeah. doesn't have prior uh, to his time period. Yeah. And then you have a Nehru who gives, he's the only ruler of India who considered Ashok uh, as a kind of, uh, as a kind of political figure to be emulated. India has had lots of Buddhist kings after Ashok. So I looked for, uh, you know, I've searched for Ashok in the uh, epigraphs in the inscriptions of Kushan rulers. I've searched for him in inscriptions of the Pala rulers of East India, the Metrikas of Gujarat, even, uh, you know, an Odisha dynasty, like uh, there were these Bhaumakara kings who were Buddhist. But Ashok, I did not find uh, there. I only, uh, you know, found him uh, in the words of one ancient king uh, who uh, repaired a dam that had been renovated by Ashok and created by Ashok's grandfather, Chandragupt, in Junagadh in Gujarat. So Rudra Daman, uh, you know, when he repairs and renovates the lake, gives the history. And he says that, you know, this I'm doing, uh, you know, this, this went into disrepair and this is now being repaired by me. But he mentions who created it, who actually uh, expanded it, that is Ashok. Ashok himself has never mentioned uh, that dam. So the really expansive memorialization of Ashok by uh, an Indian ruler would have to wait till the 20th century. It's only Nehru who, uh, you know, does it. It's yeah. done, Ashok is an archetypal Buddhist king across uh, Asia. You will find him in Southeast Asia. You will find him uh, figuring in Sri Lanka. Mm, but uh, in the Indian context, if you look at Buddhist kings, Ashok yeah. is not uh, there. Fascinating. It's interesting that uh, both Ramakrishna Paramahans in the late uh, 19th century and then further develop this, uh, Vivekanand further develops this idea, talk about the, the spiritual quest with the metaphor of the wheel that all the spokes go to the same source. They both refer to this repeatedly. And of course, Swami Vivekanand builds upon it in a in a much more elaborate way and uh, uh, and i don't know how much of this was a kind of socio political frame for vivekanand but definitely for sri ramakrishna it is uh, it's a spiritual insight he is not involved in uh, politics and the term secular doesn't feature in his universe uh, so I'm wondering, it's actually very fascinating, and I'll be thinking about this for many months that, you know, what is this fertile ground in which Nehru uh, is uh, inspired to do this? Well, the way Nehru presents it, he mm. gives emperor, he says that it's, it's a symbol of India, you yeah. know, all that India has stood for. So in that sense, he is making a gesture. Yeah. you know, uh, which is inclusive, but yeah. simultaneously, because if there is one individual who gave it a material visibility, if you're looking for something physical, where the wheel plays a central role, it has to be, uh, you know, Emperor Ashok. And that is what gets remembered, uh, you know, in Buddhist monuments in ancient India, and in other parts of uh, Asia uh, too. So uh, it is possible that Nehru, uh, you know, Nehru was a voracious reader and also a voracious conversationist. And I cannot imagine that he wasn't aware of, uh, you know, uh, this uh, fertile uh, ground where there were people engaging with, you know, some of the greats uh, you know, whether it's Vivekananda or Ramakrishna Parmanth, engaging with, uh, you know, ideas uh, using the symbol of uh, the wheel. Yeah. But because if you think about the discovery of India, you know, the historical bent in uh, Nehru, uh, 
does then seek to anchor it in terms of a long genealogy, which yeah. uh, you know goes back to uh, ancient India. And connecting it, and in a sort of in conclusion, uh, it also connects with something that troubles us so painfully today in the immediate context, right? The claim that nonviolence made India weak. Uh, in a sense, that's one of the reasons why Gandhi is killed, right? Because uh, he is seen as a threat to Hinduism because he is seen to represent uh, what his opponents call weakness, and that uh, that it it in their framing, uh, nonviolence is a kind of anti Shorya, anti. Uh, valor and 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 certainly anti macho right um so in conclusion would you like to just grapple with that you know this uh what would you like to put on the record as responding to this claim that uh because gandhi struggled with it a lot uh, you must have seen a lot of what he responds to this constantly because uh, he disagrees uh, but what is your uh, response to this claim that it made us weak, quote unquote? I, I, I don't think so. This is something, by the way, that has also been said about Emperor Ashok, that his adoption of uh, Dhamma, of Buddhism, made Indian society uh, weak. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, I, I find it just uh, amazing that uh, you can have such poor readings uh, of history. India will be remembered because of figures like uh, Gandhiji and the Buddha. They, in my opinion, these are the two, two greats that India has uh, had. You know, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And both of them are steeped in this compassion. So it all depends on how you want to see the power of India. I mean, is the power of India, is, uh, you know, its strength, just a question of coercive power or is it something which you know so and I find this amazing because on the one hand we see ourselves as being the fountainhead of spiritualism which of course we are not there are all these things you know there is non-violence there is violence there are people who uh, you know and this is across the age this is what we are I mean human beings are like that societies are like that we are an ensemble of all kinds of different things. But uh, the thing is that there are people who are very powerful and influential who see and, you know, uh, groups, political and social groups who see themselves as being uh, the, uh, you know, successors of the most spiritual uh, civilization that has ever existed in uh, the world. And then where is the spiritualism coming from? Is the spiritualism coming from raw power? You know, political power, military power, coercive power? No. Spiritualism is uh, grounded and anchored in, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, individuals and traditions in which there's absolutely no doubt that the Buddha and then Gandhi are the two greats that India has uh, produced. And both of them were, uh, in a sense, completely immersed in issues relating to nonviolence, the whole question, and within the vector of violence, you know, trying to, uh, uh, trying to work out, uh, you know, how you can produce a, a more moral way forward within all these issues. So there is idealism there, but there is also so much positivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the India that, you know, I, uh, you know, I feel comfortable with. And certainly, uh, you know, I don't see it as, uh, you know, vitiating, uh, you know, uh, a, a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of, India, which was once great and has, you know, and then became weak. No, I, I don't think uh, that was the case at all. Do most of your students share, they, do they respond to this perspective positively or are they critical of your position? 
or of your perspective? No, I think it's 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 wonderful to have conversations with them because one of the conversations always is that well, these are the ideas of Ashok, and mm. what about uh, what actually happened on the ground? And I mean, that's those are very relevant questions. And that yeah. is he just like let's say a modern political leader who talks a great deal about himself, who puts himself forward as a proponent of a, a kind of polity that has never been there in post-independence India. Uh, you know, is, is it all just talk or you know, is it based on something that, so there are all kinds of ways in which, and I really enjoy that because I don't want them to be echoes of myself. Of course, of course. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you so much for having me, Rajni. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.